Welcome to Solve It Like a Marketer. I'm Stephen Hobe. Today we're doing something a little different. To add to my series on becoming a freelancer, I sat down over Zoom with freelance videographer and entrepreneur David Fu to find out what it's like for him running a small business. He had many great tips and insights. If you like this video, please subscribe and enjoy. Where did the journey begin? Where did it begin? Oh, it's it's kind of, maybe you can relate several paths kind of just merging into one and currently I'm where it is. Uh, but uh, so I've been working in as an employee for several nonprofits for about almost 20 years. And in the meantime, I was a, I was a creative playing in bands, making videos. And so, kind of doing sort of a, the odd freelancing on the side. People would find out I'm doing, I'm making videos or whatever and uh, ask if I would work. And so I guess uh, only in the last 10, 10-ish years, the, uh, I started to take freelancing a little bit more seriously. It was a way to have uh, uh, what I believed at the time would be creative freedom. I could do have a variety of work. I could, you know, write and, and make decisions about cool music and videos and whatnot. Um, and it wasn't only until about two years ago, two or three years ago, I decided to uh, leave employment entirely and uh, just focus on working for myself. But let's talk about, let's again, go back to, I guess, the early days that you made that decision to kind of branch out on your own, uh, what are the types of barriers that you faced back then and, and how did you overcome those? Uh, two or three major ones I'll never forget. The first one is that um, when you need money, you'll take anything. You'll take any job. And the barrier with that is when you're doing jobs that you may not like or they might not be advancing your skills it's taking up your time yeah you got to there's just you can't quite get over that little hump where you're working all the time on things that they make money but that's it they don't do anything else for you um the second barrier would for me was uh, I I believed at that time about ten years ago creativity and client work was just going to happen. You would you hey I'm a creative and I'm freelancing now, so I'm going to find creative jobs, and that's just not really the case it doesn't just happen out of thin air mm -hmm. um, you might find work that's just uh, horrifically uncreative or your client your, whoever's paying you is the boss and they have the creative uh, vision and they're going to tell you no i want uh, i want this horrible looking font on this on the beginning of the video and you have no choice so and then the, i guess the third one would be education. I, I remember feeling at the time a lot of confused about how, how do you how do you find the right clients? How do you become uh, adhere to a, a creative vision? How do you which skills am I supposed to beef up? Is it my I, I want to buy more cameras and I want more editing software, but I also want I, I guess I'm supposed to have accounting skills. I'm supposed to have, uh, I'm supposed to know something about tax and business registration and sales and promotion. And you have your friends, you have your clients and you have the internet teaching you. And it's, it's easy to get be fooled into all kinds of advice and tips. It's a confusing place to sort of, uh, develop when you're by yourself in terms of education. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. Let me unpack some of this because <laughs> I'm interested. Okay. I too have suffered from the uh, I'll take anything syndrome. Um, and another course that I teach is for voiceover people, people thinking of going into voiceovers. And again, you know, sure, I say it in the beginning, if it pays, great, you're going to gain experience, you're going to build your portfolio, et cetera, et cetera. But what do you think? What point are, are you able to say, okay, great, I've gained enough experience, I have enough on the portfolio now, I should be I should be pickier, especially yeah. when you're topping yourself up constantly, potentially with lower paying jobs that are taking more time. In theory, you want higher paying jobs that don't actually require as much time. How do you turn that equation around? I wonder if the first thing anyone should do is determine what exactly is it they they wanted to do what, what did they want to excel at in the beginning because mm -hmm. it seems to me uh when I, I come across people like me and like you and my other peers and colleagues some people set out to be to have creative freedom to be an artist mm -hmm. i want to go write scripts i want to go be the cinematographer i want to go be the dance choreographer and then other people are just sort of technical oriented i want to be behind the camera i want to be the editor i want to whatever and if they didn't make that distinction in the beginning then they're sort of uh, disillusioned or or confused so like I'm going to go out and be a, a director or a script writer and you end up finding a, a corporate client who you, you sort of answered the wrong proposal or you sort of answered the wrong job posting because they were looking for someone to just film the damn thing that they, they already wrote. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, it was a blind spot. You don't know they're not looking for a director. They're not looking for a super creative. So if you know that from the beginning, then that sharpens your job searches, that sharpens your looking at proposals, that sharpens how you speak, and it sharpens mm -hmm. how you tell your friends and family what you do. I know for myself, I have an equation where I balance maybe the not so interesting jobs with the ones that really get me going creatively and I allow that to to balance myself yeah, yeah I, I agree with that um, to answer your first question which is when do you sort of make that switch to 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 start moving your portfolio away from the 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 the, the pay the bills jobs to the the, the stuff you really want to do um, I guess if whatever you choose well first somebody told me success starts when you start saying no so if you find it in yourself mm. if you can maybe you can afford to live for two or three months or maybe you can afford to work into the wee hours of the night if a, a project comes along or you invent a project yourself that mm. is this it has a hundred percent of your interest and your your passion and this is this something that you would do no matter what um do it you know um I, I can't think of anything else other than the moment you do something it it starts to snowball you get the the taste you get the feel for it and maybe that means you can do two of those projects and next month and less of a project you hate uh I think it takes a bit of courage. You might be hungry for a month or two. Yeah, it takes a lot of courage. I want to touch on kind of how you've marketed yourself. I see, you know, for instance, your 
very LinkedIn, um, literally, and I'm interested to hear how you negotiate that. And I will say as a caveat, um, in all the years that I've been doing stuff, I don't think I'll ever call myself a sales marketer. I, I hate the notion of sales. And I also think that marketing as a term has a real stigma to it. I'm really going off base here. I'm just throwing some stuff out just because <laughs> it's coming into my head. But, you know, it's interesting when I work with certain organizations where they say, well, we don't do marketing. I'm like, you know what? Everybody does marketing, but marketing is like huge. It's a huge area and it doesn't mean sales. Anyway, that's no. my, that's my thing. Okay. Back to you. All right. So how do you, maybe we'll just talk about the now. So how do you, how do you promote? How do you engage? How do you brand yourself? Oof. Um. Okay, a bit of background first. Yes. I am a part-time child minding, like, 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 what do you call it? A house husband. So I'm watching kids two thirds of my awake time. So that leaves me basically with almost very, almost no time for marketing and branding. And I have a bit of a background in marketing. So this is how I came up with this model for myself. So of the bazillion models and combinations and variables that anyone could do, this is, this is mine. And this, what I do is I use the tools that I have and I'm not going, and I don't, I don't uh, sort of, which what's the word um i try to avoid complicating things so what i do is i rely on text I, I don't have the time to be making videos i don't have the time to be making elaborate websites i don't have the time to have multiple social media platforms i can't do mailers i can't do brochures i can't do cold calling but i can write I can, for 10 to 30 minutes a day, before I wake up, no, sorry, like when I wake up and before I get out of bed, I might be able to write on my phone. Or what I call uh, toilet posts, where the, um, our marketing department is just like in the bathroom. Um, if you got a chance, you sit down and just type something. And so I, uh, for, my, for my marketing, I rely almost exclusively on LinkedIn with just text posts. And that has, that's where all of my clients come from right now. And just a side note, I think that's a bad idea. You should, don't put all your eggs in one basket. One day, for some reason, LinkedIn could disappear or my account could get hacked, I'd, it'd be over. But, but for now, when time is tight, um, I rely on on uh, the one platform with with the one format and occasionally make a podcast episode for my for my show and um what else let me let me dive in i i just yeah, want to sure, sure. kind of reiterate what, what you just said and say actually that piece of advice i think is extremely valid i think that when people start out um, they think that they need to be on every bloody platform out there because everybody else is. Um, and I'm always an advocate for that is absolutely the wrong thing to possibly do. Um, first of all, every platform has a, a different audience. Every platform has a learning curve. Every platform should be approached differently, have its own methodology, and it's, it can be a time sucker. So I think, as you said, I think given that you're dealing with this amount of time and the fact that you're able to hop on to, to LinkedIn and put something out, I think is phenomenal, quite frankly. 
Thank you. And then, and then, you know, when you ship the kids off to university or maybe before, um, you know, if Instagram is still around, you'll be able to do Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> if it's still around. If it's still around, who knows, um, right? But I, I think it's, it's, it's a valid point. It's not like, mm, I think choosing your platform is about what is going to work well for you and most benefit your business. Well, I have a third thing, most benefit the audience I'm going after. So that's the other part of this sort of Venn diagram. So the first thing I had to determine was what do I have at my disposal? My thumbs for writing, my bottomless pit of ideas, and but I didn't know right away it was going to be LinkedIn. I was like, is it going to be Instagram? Is it going to be Facebook? Is it going to be, maybe I don't want anything and just stick to a uh, cold emailing. Like I had no idea uh, until I started thinking, well, who is my ideal client? And how do I get, how do I get in touch with them? Or how do I get in front of them? Or how, how do I make them see and hear me? on a regular basis. And it led me to that, that thinking about, okay, I'm going to be a nonprofit communications manager and I'm going to put myself in the shoes, their shoes and imagine a day at their job and who my colleagues are, who my friends are. Uh, I started asking my own colleagues in the same roles. And I started to understand that at that time, LinkedIn was this place where you have permission to talk about the sector. See, on Facebook, you kind of don't because that's mm -hmm. for friends and family. And on Instagram, I don't have time to be taking pictures and videos. But on LinkedIn, it's, there's this, it's kind of a, a, um, a, an expected and a safe place to talk industry talk. Mm -hmm. And it, the thing I knew about nonprofit communications managers and coordinators and directors is that they're in the nonprofit space, uh, they're always interested in learning. And they're, they tend to be self-trained. Mm -hmm. So this is where I could, my bottomless pit of ideas might be useful as sort of daily advice. So now their needs and my my abilities are starting to overlap and i think you know the the fundamental what we try and do in marketing is solve a problem and i think what you're saying is true it's it's saying okay by putting myself in their shoes what is the problem that i potentially can solve for them how can i make their life easier in some exactly. ways that's exactly it and that's the uh, that's the the one thing I set out to do every day and like consistently daily. I'm going to go onto LinkedIn. I will spend maximum 20 minutes and I will teach a nonprofit communication manager something. There are a few sort of principles when I'm uh, assessing whether I want to take on a client. Okay. And I guess it probably keeping the clients happy starts with my pre-assessment and the, and one thing is I, I won't bore you with with a list but is this someone i genuinely want to work with mm -hmm. um and maybe even if it is if they don't if if they would also have to want to work with me it has to be kind of a a no-brainer we both love each other we want to work with each other that's got to be the first thing um because I get energized by liking the person. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, some businesses will take anybody. They never say no, and that's okay. Yeah. Uh, but for me, that's the first thing. And then um, another thing would be the, the clarity of the scope of work. So mm -hmm. whatever I've promised, I make absolutely sure that we're on the same page about it, and that and and I get it wrong sometimes, but. I've done my best to explain what it is I'm promising and capable of and delivering. And, and 
and there was a time where I was bad at this, but I'm getting better at saying no to things that are outside of my sort of abilities or, or time capacity. Yeah. Uh, because S- Stephen, you probably know this, but it's, it's pretty easy to keep clients happy if just by doing the thing, just by doing the job, mm-hmm. there's no reason to do more or do extra. You just got to do the thing that you promised mm-hmm. and the thing that they, ex- that, that they expected. Um, and actually also, uh, um, sorry, I forgot. So clarity uh, of, of our expectations. Um, and we also do, uh, I also do follow-ups. So every, every time a, cl- a project is finished, we, we schedule a follow-up one or two months after just to see how things are going. And I keep kind of an open door about that stuff. I'm not, I'm not like, you know, well, you're on the hour, you owe me money. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they, that it gives them a bit of a, uh, of a guarantee or a warranty that I didn't just get the, finish the job and get the hell out of there. Mm-hmm. So I kind of want to feel like uh, more of a teammate than, than uh, yeah. just like a one-off vendor. So, yeah. Yeah. So all of this probably summarizes into more of a, I, I guess I'm looking for more of a less of a transactional thing and more of a, like a teammate scenario. And I've mm-hmm. become better at finding those. Yeah. And I, I wholeheartedly agree. It's funny. The few times that I've been termed a vendor, I just want to go throw up because it's it just seems very like it seems transactional to me right and like you um the work that i'm doing i want to believe in and i want to believe it's helping in some way the client and i have a vested interest i'm not just producing a widget and selling the widget right i want them to succeed their success is my success um so you know maybe that's that's also wrapped up in the whole customer service thing is 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 believing in your client but you're right I and mean, when you say it's also getting things done i think that um being able to relieve a client's stress is good customer service so if you know they're stressed about something or they're getting pressure to get something done if you can de- deliver that thing sooner or on time then that's good customer service or uh in, ensure that they they know it's taken care of that they're accountable to someone else too and so if if you can assure them this part is taken care of then you've taken that off their plate Often that's the only thing they need. Mm -hmm. Uh, Another thing that popped into my head, which I know I'm older than you, um, but not that old, um, is, you you know, there are no guarantees now. And so I'm always thinking in terms of, well, you know, when I am older, maybe I can't move around as much as I could now. How have I set myself up? I, I mean, I don't think I'll ever retire because I don't think that's even a possibility in today's day and age. I just, I just don't. And I don't, you know, trust the government to support me in any way when I'm older. And so, again, I feel as though the freelance track allows you to just always have something there. You know, because as you said, you've yeah. always got ideas. You're always going to have ideas. You know, maybe you won't have as much energy when you're 70, but probably you still want to be creative in some ways and work and help people. You know, what you're saying is making me think that if if you if you stick it out for a long time and you you do well at freelancing, what you're what you're incidentally building is uh, a. a a, a type of survival skill. I think so. So, yeah, I wonder, I, I like what you're talking about. Uh, when the day comes where you have less energy and you're older and you probably can't retire, that you have the uh, the survival skill in, in, in that 
it's it's sort of a a, a problem solving uh, muscle or mentality to who knows get paid for some great workshops get paid for I don't know a some kind of online business where you don't have right. to lift, lift a finger. I don't know. Right. And, you know, one of the upsides to this whole pandemic thing is that people are now connecting more online. Two years ago, I couldn't have imagined suggesting to a client, let's have a Zoom meeting. They would have, wouldn't have known what I meant, right? But now it's very, it's the, the mentality is shifting which opens up huge possibilities, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I, uh, I'd, could I add one thing for your students? Yes, please, please. Um, all of this, I don't think should scare anyone from working at a, at a job they really love. Mm -hmm. Because I think, I mean, for every type of, class everyone takes whether it's in art or their health or medicine or science and whatever um, a portion of the students are going to make a different decision after graduating yeah. and and i think for those who who decide maybe creative freedom is not for them or or uh, uh, entrepreneurship and doing your own marketing and your own financing and all this stuff is not for them um, i think you can still have the the creative and freelancer mindset uh, and find a good job yeah and that everything you and i have been talking about in terms of the things you want as a freelancer you can find in a job yeah, yeah you i just, agree you got to have this type of conversation and this type of course that you're teaching are this applicable in job hunting and yeah. looking for that instead of ideal clients it's ideal boss Absolutely. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And I think sometimes when folks are job searching, just like we talked about clients, they'll take anything that comes along. And also they forget that they're interviewing the interviewer as much as they are being interviewed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you know, when, when I was younger, I, I didn't know that, right? And so I got myself into all sorts of work situations, which were horrific, <laughs> yeah. right? Just yeah. absolutely hell in a handbasket. <laughs> um, some really crackers ones. Um, but I wouldn't do that again. But I think, you know, I think that, yeah, I agree with you that for those watching that potentially, eh, you know, freelancing is not really for me. If you can take anything away from this, realize, you know, you can find a good job and you have the power to find that good job. The power is not always all in the employer. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please do hit that subscribe button. You can also catch me on Instagram and Facebook for extra content and you never miss an episode or connect with me on LinkedIn. Those links are below. I'll see you every week with a new video, so please stay tuned and together let's solve it like a marketer.